Hello horror hounds and welcome back as we are taking some time out to look at a curious trio of movies from the 1970s, Japanese vampire movies. And after the vampire doll, now is the turn of 1971's Lake of Dracula. A young girl named Akiko loses her dog whilst playing on the beach. At sunset, she follows the dog to a European-style mansion where she comes across an old man, a dead lady, and something so horrifying that it causes her to black out and consider the entire encounter to have been nothing but a dream. The film then picks up 18 years later. Akiko is living near a lake with her sister, Naksuto, when that past trauma collides once again with her seemingly happy and contented life. Four years before the publication of Stephen King's Salem's Lot, Mikio Yamamoto's film deals with the delivery of a coffin to a sleepy community and the subsequent spread of infection, the vampire's spreading influence. Except here that influence is in the form of a web with Akiko at its centre. We can see that web closing in around her before she herself does. As with the vampire doll, before it, we're presented with yet another take on Western vampirism. Here it's presented as a blood taint or perhaps a genetic disease that can skip multiple generations and then resurface again. Interestingly, here that genetic trait is identified as being European, a vampire who took a Japanese bride and so vampirism is brought like a disease from Europe to Japan. Where the vampire doll was a tentative merging of Western vampire tradition and the more typically oriental notions of a vengeful ghost, Lake of Dracula incorporates much more of the traditional trappings of the Western vampire film. A black cape wearing vamp, here set off with a stylish white scarf, fangs, coffins, a Renfield type helper and stakes. Yet, as one online reviewer I read astutely observes, whilst the surface detail tells you that Lake of Dracula is a vampire movie, laying beneath the surface is a film about a woman's fear of men. With the prologue set in Akiko's childhood, it's easy to read this as a film about trauma of a sexual or a violent nature, leaving a lasting misunderstood effect on a woman and making her current life worse as a result. In this way, it bears a passing acquaintance with the early Jallo films of Dario Argento, who himself mined the idea of the return of the repressed, usually through a Freudian lens. Suddenly the trustworthy men around Akiko are potential attackers, rapists, and the first Attempt at an attack by the vampire is framed in her mind as a rape attempt which is brushed off by those around her. Vampires themselves are, of course, metaphors for sex made flesh. They're also a Freudian's wet dream with all the penetrating fluid exchanges, sexual liberation of female victims and the oh-so-phallic stakes. Lake of Dracula cries out for a Freudian reading. Current issues find their root in a sexual childhood trauma and the release of the repressed is played out very nicely through the use of fast intercutting of scenes from the start of the film threatening to burst through into her modern day adult life. The juxtaposition of stark images, it's pure cinema basically. With these three films in the Bloodthirsty trilogy, Yamamoto seems to have set up a narrative structure that uh, he's very comfortable with. The end of the vampire doll was a sudden explosion of violence followed by silence and Lake of Dracula ramps that up considerably. The vampire in this dies hard, rivaling perhaps Christopher Lee's demise at the end of Hammer's Dracula, known in the US as the Horror of Dracula. There's a great moment towards the end of body horror as a long dormant body is disturbed. That actually made this old horror hound gasp. There's a victim towards the middle in a hospital being called by the vampire in a very similar way that Dracula would lure Lucy out of her house when he wished to feed. But in this film, uh, the nurse who tries to stop her from leaving the hospital and calls out sees her turn 
and give just a devilish smile and the previously somnambulistic patient starts to sprint towards her lover killer. You'll only find extremely disturbing moments like that, I think, in Japanese cinema. It's where they excel with nothing flashy or showy, no CGI, no effects, just a look and the nurse's reaction of stark, abject horror at the sight of something that's just wrong, slightly off kilter. It's moments like these that make me adore Japanese horror cinema. So in conclusion, sure, like the vampire doll before, it's a little campy, it's a little hokey, it's a little B-movie-like, but these are the kind of things I think that we, we love about horror movies from the 70s uh, of that ilk, the, the Hammers, the Roger Corman's Poe movies, and Yamamoto's Bloodthirsty trilogy. Lake of Dracula has more energy than the Vampire Doll, possibly because there are a few more locations, there are a few more characters to keep things jigging along. Both the Vampire Doll and Lake of Dracula seem enjoyable if slight affairs whilst you're watching them. Nothing truly groundbreaking but they have an atmosphere and they're leavened with moments that you would never find in Hammer films if they'd made a hundred Dracula movies. Things that just, they linger in your memory like a dream, fragments, moments that mean that I'm going to be very happy to return to these films again and again in a similar way as I rewatch Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee battle it out over the necks of their pretty young ladies. <laughs> Next up, wrapping up the Bloodthirsty trilogy, is Evil of Dracula, and I really hope you can join me when we chat about that movie.